Welcome to the Life's Worth Living podcast. I'm your host, John Gossett. Thanks for coming back for another week and another episode. Really excited to be here with you tonight and excited about what we're going to present tonight. But I uh, want to thank our sponsor, GTM Builders, for allowing us to record in this beautiful model home. If you're in the market and thinking about building a new home, reach out to GTM Builders. Visit their website at gtmbuilders.com or visit one of their model homes in the Tooele Valley. Tonight's episode is brought to you by A. Warner Homes Real Estate. A. Warner Homes Real Estate is a Tooele County uh, real estate agency. They handle Northern Utah. You can reach them at 801-867-5078. And they're running a special right now. Interest rates are super low, but uh, they're running a special right now. If you're a veteran or a first responder, they will pay for your appraisal and your home inspection. So uh, really grateful to have you guys back. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. If you have ideas or thoughts that you want to run past us, uh, ideas that you think would be great to uh, have on an episode, reach out to us at 435-277-0235 or email us at LicewithLivingFoundation at gmail.com. So really excited for those of you that are watching. You probably recognize the faces, uh, maybe. Um, tonight, we've got a couple of guests, Ed and Barbara Hansen. So Ed and Barbara Hansen are on the board of directors for Liceworth Living Foundation. Ed is the vice president and my buddy, right? So really thankful for them being here tonight. And we're going to kind of talk about their story and, and uh, what led them to be involved in the Liceworth Living Foundation and kind of lay it all out there tonight. So uh, I appreciate you guys coming and being here. You bet. I drove them. They don't have a choice. They're stuck till this <laughs> is recorded. So, And I wasn't going to be here. And, and Barb wasn't going to be here, but we worked it. And they're both going to be having a discussion with us tonight. So I really appreciate it. So back up, and I know for a lot of people within Tooele County, everybody in Tooele County knows Ed Hansen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe they they know him from uh, maybe from the church. Ed happens to be the mechanic in town. They know him for scouting. They know him for the guy's a stud, um, <laughs> the vice president, and and he is city councilman for city of Tooele. So um, Barb, everybody knows Barb. Everybody loves Barb. And uh, so we're excited she's here tonight as well to share this story because not, I guess for people that uh, have lost somebody to suicide, everybody has their individual story, you know. Every person goes through the grief process differently, and uh, I'm just grateful to have you both here tonight. So back us up. I'll start with you, Ed. Back us up and tell us a little bit about you, where you were born and raised, how many siblings. Tell us all the good stuff that we don't know. All right. So I was, I was born in Twilla in the uh, Twilla Hospital in the Spook, where the Spook Alley is now. The asylum. The asylum. And so that was a long time ago. <laughs> both me and Barb were born there. They were in the 1950s. In the 50s, so we are kind of older. <laughs> <laughs> um, grew up in Twilla. We, went at, we lived on Nelson Avenue. Grew up there for my first... 18 years of my life. Um, I have seven brothers and a sister. So we was in a lot of trouble for my parents, and but we had a lot of fun. Um, we grew up uh, doing all kinds of activities, you know, between sports and church and, and different things. And my father owned Claire's Auto Center. And so that became the family business that I took over uh, when he retired. Um, Involved in scouting forever, you know, that's at least 40 years of my life as a scout leader and then and then as a young man. So uh, I was involved in scouts and, you know, we, we have animals. My, we, my children did the, the local stock shows and the raised animals and we lived on a, our little in-town ranch, you know, wannabe ranch. So we, my family grew up there and uh, I have five children and uh, I have uh, 16 gr grandchildren now and my, all my kids live here except for the one that lives in heaven so yeah. yep, and his family lives down in southern Utah now but we keep close with them so 
And so now I think even today you visit a stock show, but it wasn't for you guys or your kids. It was for the grandkids, for my right? Grandkids, yeah. So How we cool spend is the day that? At the stock show, yeah. And it's got to be fun having them close by, everybody in it town. Is. And it is. It's nice. And so, uh, eight, eight siblings. Seven so siblings. Seven siblings. Eight. Oh, you were well, counting yourself. Eight. I was counting so myself. So yeah, there was six brothers and a sister than me. So and that's my, a big My parents family. had a handful. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> and that many boys, you know, we just, we was kind of a, you know, like to do things, <laughs> raise a little heck a little bit, you know. So yeah, it was. It was a little wild sometimes. So uh, there, there's a story I heard about you. Uh-oh. <laughs> when, you, when you were a little kid, I think you said you were four or five. Oh. And uh, were you playing with fireworks or? Well, there, there's two stories. When I was a little tiny, I was walking by the ironing board and the iron fell off and it went on my arm and, and burnt my arm. Ouch. Yeah. And so then so I, I obviously like to be burned or something because then when I was when I was five years old I was I had a cousin that lived at our house for a while he was staying it with my parents and he had fireworks and matches and everything down the basement so I went and took them and headed down a couple of doors down down the street and lit the firework firecrackers till I ran out and kept lighting matches and I caught on fire you're wearing sure my a polyester plaid, shirt. Plaid shirt, you know. And I think it was a little wool Pendleton shirt, and the the match fell down in your pocket, didn't it? Well, my shirt my shirt caught on fire right where my pocket is. So I was running up the street. That's the story. I remember just a little tiny bit of it still. But there was uh, uh, Billy Williams and Don Spenlow was uh, washing their car, washing Don's car in the driveway, and uh, Billy, you know, grabbed me and rolled me over and. He did the really stop, drop, life, and roll. You know, my, whole, my whole chest was on fire yeah. and burning, and so, yeah, and so, yeah, that was a little crazy when you were a little kid to have that happen, you know, and I can remember some details about it, but nothing really bad. I don't remember the pain or anything, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so how many times have you taught the scouts to stop, drop, and roll now? Yeah, I've taught the stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> you, and, don't, you don't keep and running. And if somebody's playing with matches, I get really... A little nervous. Yeah, a little nervous, a little anxious, especially my, especially my grandkids. But even the scouts, they'd be off doing something dumb like that. and So, yeah, so it, it still winds me up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just had to, I had to tease you about that because I've, I've never forgot that story. So one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning is I've got my wife here too, Tracy. And uh, we thought it would just be fun to have just kind of a discussion and talk about <clears throat> this together because we know the story. Yeah. And everything, but uh, you know, it's it's interesting. So I'll back up and tell you the first time I met Ed was in 1980. I think it was 89. Yeah, it was in the 1989. Years. I was working out at Dugway Proving Grounds, and I borrowed my boss's flatbed truck to drive to Orem to do some work on my parents' house, and. It made it to the ranch in Skull Valley, you know, halfway down the road, and something happened with the fan or the fan clutch or something, and I ended up having to have it towed to Claire's Auto. I think I had it towed to Claire's Auto. I don't remember if you guys towed it, but it got towed there, and you fixed it, yeah. and I remembered, you know, it's funny how things come back to you, but I remember that, I remember meeting you, and then in 2002, Tracy and I moved out, and I think we we were in the process of moving or just had moved and our minivan broke down on I eighty and we got to meet at again and <laughs> and we've been I remember, I, remember that, I remember that one. Yeah, you remember that one? <laughs> the well, star yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> it was sexy. Yeah. Minivans were sexy. Four wheel drive aerial star, yeah. There you yeah. Go. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tracy doesn't miss it. <laughs> no. She doesn't miss it at all. But uh it seems like ever since then, you know, we've been friends, like family, and so... Yeah, we hit it off good. It was awesome. Yeah, somebody had to bail me out a number of times, <laughs> yes. so, and that was Ed. So, you raised your five kids here, and they're all adults. You've got grandkids from every one of them, yeah. and uh, you, about, it's pushing seven years ago, so probably about nine years ago, it was 2014, but prior to that, a few years before right. that, um, 
your son Jed started to tell. Well, let's back up. Let's not jump right into that. Let's back up. Tell us about Jed. Okay. Barb's got some good stories about Jed oh, he's when, he was, when he was a little boy. He is an amazing boy. You. Well, he was just, he was full of energy <laughs> and uh, always was trying dangerous things and fun things. And, you know, it was great. You know, I get, I get accused as an adult from people that know the stories that I was maybe too free with him and that him and Zeb especially, that he was always out doing like crazy fun. stuff. Just having fun. Just fun, you know, like just... jumping off the top of a nine ice haystack or building fires in the backyard and catching the back fire yard on fire. And, <laughs> that was you know, a good one. That, that, you want to hear that story? Let's hear it. Bye. This is my little Jed. He's four years old, right? We're in our house. I'm in the house, and I just had this feeling to go out in the yard, and there's my little boy putting the fire out with our back hose. We hadn't and finished the backyard yet. What had so happened is there was a field adjacent to our backyard also, and I says, Jedediah, what are you doing? And he says, I'm putting out the fire. Well, he he loved fires, and he did. He put it out. He started it, and he put it out. And he's four years old. That doesn't sound very good for me as a mom, but I haven't left him. I mean, I was pretty on him all the time. He and then he did it quit. again a few days later, so then he got his butt kicked. So, and then we decided to Cherokee engine fires in our sandbox. And I'd say, whenever you want a fire, you let me know, and we will have a little fire in the sandbox. And it worked. It worked. He was cute. Cutest little guy you ever saw. He was you know, funny. We'd, I'd go outside. I'd be in the house, and they'd be out playing. I'd go outside, and him and Zeb were out in the corral with the cows jumping on, trying to. Oh, they, they were riding the bull riders, cow. you know, and <laughs> stuff. They'd have the lead rope wrapped around them like they were plank straps and. Oh, everything. Just and like, when he says they jumped off his stacks, they jump. He'd get at the very top of the haystack and jump off. Yeah, I was, was. It scared mom. Well, but they, you know, he had a horse that was really kind of really hyper that we had. And when he was five years old, he started riding it, and that was really good for him and the horse because they both had that little bit of wild spirit in them, you know, that, uh, and they fit well together, and they rode that year, horse for years and years. She was a big, beautiful buckskin, and he was a tiny little boy, and he had his big cowboy hat on this little peanut head and this big <laughs> belt buckle and <laughs> these little tight wranglers, and people just were amazed. He'd run the track and just... They were crazy. It was really neat. He was adorable. So, lots of fun. And then that same, polar, polar a few adventure. years later, he did the dance out at the rodeo grounds. They asked if anyone wanted to dance. And he stripped down to his underpants and danced out in the mud yes. with everybody. And he was very proud of that. <laughs> and he probably would have done it every year after that oh, if he'd oh, been yeah. asked to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He was in his, uh, what were the underwear back then? They, they were the cute under little. Underoos. Underoos. Yeah. He just was. What do you mean back then? That's what I'm wearing, Barb. <laughs> <laughs> but he did. He always was full of adventure. He loved hunting and fishing. Um, loved and life. Zeb and him were just like, you know, together all the time. Mm-hmm. Zeb's four years younger, but they just were, and he just included him in everything. And uh, they, they fished together, they hunted together, they did all the crazy stuff together. And he would do um, anything. Even, even as teenagers, you know, they just yeah. went hunting together all the time. And what they bring. Well, and yeah. catching frogs and, and, and whatever and just adventurous stuff, stuff there's always yeah. the best friends yeah. best friend yeah. yeah that's way cool yeah. yeah good boy and you know my my earliest memory of of Jed was I think we were driving up Druby Road and we were about to smelt her and we were driving you do you remember this Tracy we were driving south on Druby and all of a sudden, this bullet bike, I think Jed was still in high school. Oh. And all of a sudden, this bullet bike comes ripping up, probably doing 80 miles an hour. That's what he got his senior year. And, and he waved and then willied and lifted that thing up and blew through the intersection at a full willy. Wow. <laughs> and, and I said to Tracy, he's nuts. Yeah. I like that kid. <laughs> he's just a good kid. But he, he did. He loved to, do, to be on the edge. He did. Yeah, he loved to be on the edge. You know, he had that side of him that just was that. And then the other side of it, well, he yeah. just would do anything for anybody. He was a yeah. tender heart. He just tender heart. He, he mm-hmm. made sure everybody was covered. He'd always help me when I needed it, um, help other people. He just, you know, he's that kind of kid that when he lived down in McKellar and that his family, they just always was helping his neighbors and his friends and doing things, you know, for everybody. And the, he was a really good friend with the England Dusty and Cody England and was always doing things for them and helping them and, and they were helping him. him and they it were was, helping him. It was, it was amazing. 
And yeah. yeah. And yeah, that's just the kind of kid he was. He just, you know. And a hard worker. Hard well, worker, yeah. and he was. He was the boy that when Dad would say, we're going to muck corrals tomorrow, he'd surprise him and have, be out there before they planned on being there and have it started before Eddie ever got out there. He liked that. He liked to surprise you. He liked to get in there and, and do, you know, do things for you. One day I asked him, I told him I wanted my patio slurried. And I was meaning someday, and he went and got the stuff and did it, like, two hours later. And like he was same. tired after yeah. work, you know? So he, that's just the kind of boy he is. And I say that he is because he is. He's still around. Yeah. 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 Same boy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Heart of gold. He's keeping a little wild in heaven right now. I <laughs> hope he's building this a really good match. And <laughs> he was going to have a pond. He had deer. He planned on getting building a pond. He had it all planned and had great ideas. And he did the things that he said he was going to do. He didn't just imagine. He he did it. He made them happen. He did. He was a he was a doer. Yeah. So now was it was it Jed or Zeb that had treed a cougar and then got up in the that was in the tree and was spanking it. That was that, that was, was actually both of them have done that. They've done that. <laughs> so they get up in the tree and they're poking it or whatever, you know. I, don't know. I remember You're not really supposed to do that, but no, you know, no. <laughs> a little adventure in them, you know? <laughs> It was funny because I remember seeing the picture in the in his garage and yeah. that made me think of that, that yeah. over at his house. So so Jed uh, grew up, graduated from high school, hard worker. Yeah, he worked at uh, US Magnesium for a while, then he went to work at Hexel. During that time, he got married to Heather. Yeah. You know, they had the three kids. So tell, tell us about uh, Jed and Heather. And Jed and Heather, they met when Jed was um, a, senior. a senior and graduating from high school. And, uh, and uh, you know, he, he dated a few other girls, and he just met her, and they fell in love. And it, was, it wasn't too much longer that they got married, you know, right after high school. Um, uh, really great girl, you know, just... Uh, She's and, adorable. And she was the perfect one to put up with Jed and his shenanigans and stuff because she was so patient and and uh, just, uh, yeah, she just easy going, you know. She's, She's a singer. cool girl. A, she is. Yeah, and just yeah. a really... And she just, really, you know, yeah. and so he... But they had the Gage, Wyatt, and Hunter, the three kids, and uh, they lived... Um, they live at first... On McKell- oh, not McKellar Lane. Um, yeah. Well, they lived around. They lived in a couple of places, and then they ended up building a house on McKellar Lane. Actually, they took a little old home that little was destroyed, home. and they made it a. They remodeled it to a, a giant beautiful home. home. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful home. home. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. Home. I met the tile guy. I think. Yeah, I yeah. think so. I think he might have been <laughs> a good know, friend. Might know the tile guy. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. he he and, turned that into a beautiful home. Yeah, so they, they bought that home. They weren't married very long, I don't think. But they bought that home and fixed, you know, well, lived there for a while. We remodeled it in a little chicken coop. It really, it literally was like a, it was made out of machine boxes from the depot. Yeah, and ammo, 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 ammo boxes. <laughs> and it looked like a chicken coop. And there was like, you know, they had animals living in there. Right. It was a mess. They it was worked a hard on that. He had like and two acres there. By the time. And uh, yeah. just kind of what he wanted to do, you know. Yeah. And, it was a brick home, a big, beautiful you know, brick he, home. He uh, generaled the, the construction of it and built the home. And, yeah, and his that, good friend yeah. Dusty helped him. Yeah. He was working, working at Hexel at the time. And, you know, they, he did, did construction on the side with the England construction guys. And yeah, he just. I remember when he called me and says, "Hey, will you come and, come and tile my house?" And I went and looked, and that's when it was the little house. And, and the then, floors were like this. Then a few years later, <laughs> yeah, the floors were a little uh, <laughs> tilted. But uh, then he called me back and he says, "Hey, I'm going to remodel that house. Will you come back and do some more tile work?" And when I pulled up, I was like, "Holy cow! This isn't even this the same is this place. big beautiful home." And yeah. he couldn't even hardly tell that Mm-mm. it was an addition, you know. And I don't know how you call that an addition because it was a total new house. It was kind you of know. just built up around the whole kitchen yeah. and the little. And they just saved room. like twenty thousand dollars for it to be an addition instead of a new construction. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> and it was yeah. such a cool house, and he was really proud of 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 what he'd oh, built he built and everything. And so, so tell me, so. Everybody kind of has an idea of who he is. Mm-hmm. So, 
what happened to kind of lead to the 2014? What, what, what started to happen? What did you notice first? Well, you know, looking back on it, it's things I noticed that I didn't notice, mm-hmm. you know, because even, even when he was like senior in high school and stuff, now that I look back, I think it's all related to, you know, just because he started trying different things then. You know, he was he, the kind of boy that would try things, but he never, you know, and this mama hit her head in the sand. I didn't like to know, and he would he'd try, he'd experiment and stuff. He was experimenting little stuff as a senior in high school. He quit wrestling, you know, he wrestled his whole life. That was From the thing time he talk was about. three to... That was the life he was really good at. And then his senior And then his senior he seriously decided not to wrestle, mm-hmm. Yeah. you know, when he was doing other things, you know, and so, and so he... You know, nothing really drastic at that time, but he was experimenting with, you know, different kind of... I don't think anything hard. I mean, it was bad stuff, (laughs) marijuana and, you know, bad stuff, but nothing... So so looking back on that, you know, he was, you know, and then just seeing some of the the signs that I've learned about now, you know, as he went through his life, but, you know, talking to him about drug, the drug addiction part of him, you know, was when he would, when he would be open with us about it, you know, when it got towards that last couple of years, um... Um, he would talk about that when he was working at Excel, they did work lots of shift work. They worked them funny shifts, you know, and uh, his back was sore or whatever. And, and there people would just say, hey, just take one of these and, you know, it'll help you through the night and or whatever and give you energy or whatever. And so that's where he says it really started with the addiction that's that, when he got addicted. That, that ended up taking his life, you know, that addiction there. But uh, um, that started there and, it, you know, it just developed into that kind of things, and from what we've learned about, too, is that he has that personality to be an addictive kid, so. He does. And so that personality was there, and so it just developed from there, you know, to more and more prescription drugs and more and more prescription drugs, and then you end up where you can't afford, afford, afford the prescription drugs, so at the end, you know, the last while was, he was on heroin, you know, and. It's yeah. cheaper. Cheap, yeah, it's, it's easier, a lot cheaper, it's really right. easy to get. Well, you know. and he would always say, don't worry about me unless I ever do heroin, then you need to worry. So that he told his sister, don't worry about me unless I'm shooting it. If I'm just, don't, and he just kept, you know. Doing more and then more, you know, we so. found out that he was doing that. But Jed had the personality that he was so up all the time. I did. I didn't know when he was on drugs and when he wasn't. I got to where I thought when he was on drugs, I didn't think he was. And when he wasn't on, I thought he was. I, I never did nail it. I couldn't figure it right out. So Eddie had better sense of knowing. But then he went to alcohol. He tried. He went to rehab. And he was doing very well in rehab. And But that bombed out and... It didn't end up being... It didn't come on the rehab. It seemed like the rehab's for him anyway. He would be pretty good for a while there, but they, he'd meet a lot of new friends that were drug addicts. Uh-huh. After the rehab, then he would hook up with them, and then he'd be back on drugs and have another connection to get And it was sad, drugs, but there was know. even a few connections in rehab, which really surprised me. Yeah. So you have to be careful. It's I mean, they can get it anywhere, I guess. I guess it's... And especially if they're not committed to trying you know, to really... If you're to really not totally... Get off of it. Yeah. He would tell us that, you know, that if I was rich and, you know, because I really think the only reason he wanted to get off of it was because of his family. Right. He because said he, he was tell rich. Us he, would, he liked it. He liked it. He thing, liked the way he felt. The thing about him is he was hyperactive. And anyway, and he, he probably should have been on medicine for, you know, ADD. ADD. But never did that, you know. But I think maybe that's part of why he felt better on it. He probably felt more level. I don't know. I'm guessing, you know. I don't know. I don't know. But so he started. It started to go from innocent things to stay awake for the shift work, yeah. or just fall asleep or pain when he had to sleep back, during the day. Yeah. Pain in the back, and he was in an accident. Yeah, he's in a couple of accidents that, and that caused back, back pain. And, yeah, and so. As a matter of fact, I was the mama that one night he told me his back was hurting so bad and he was getting teary. I thought that that really was happening, and it was. But he needed, his body needed drugs. And when I, I took him to the emergency room, and of course they probably spotted it right off. But I thought he really, I didn't realize that he just needed more drugs. You know? Well, actually your brain, uh, 
tells, tells you, you have to have them. That you're in yeah. pain. Your yes. brain doesn't recognize you. Yes. So pain. he was, and I was the panicked mom, was taking him to the emergency room. So it's just... You it's know, that, that last couple of years before he, he took his life, um, you know, there were lots of things that I did with him because I knew he was on drugs. And, you know, I, I, he was, it was getting to the point that he was spending all his money instead of paying the house payment, instead of paying that stuff. The kids never, the, they didn't really ever go without, but they would have lost their home and different things. So that last couple of years, I spent a lot of time with him, trying to help him. And, and there was, you know, there was times during the rehab, you know, that, that Heather actually left, Heather actually left for a while, you know. And during that time, he was, he was really suicidal. And I spent a lot of nights there with him and stuff like that, because he would be, he'd be talking about it and, there was even a couple times that, because during his drug, his heavy drug use and everything, of course, he didn't have enough money, so he was stealing a lot of things from me. Which he and, would never do. I mean, his no. dad's best friend. So. And he would pawn with the pawn shops. And, you know, and then you'd have to go But that just shows and you how terrible and drugs are. And I did that cause... more than once, mm -hmm. you know, and then he'd take them again and... and uh, you know, stealing money and stealing different kind of things. And did he know that you knew? Did he know you were buying them back? Yeah, he did. He yeah. Did. So did he put you sort of in a financial problem by bailing him we were, out? Oh. Well, that's that's the that's the thing. He developed all financial problems for me, and he had the financial problems. But uh, we started. You know, it's it's hard to know what I should have done because even looking back, I don't know what I should have done. Yeah. Well, you did because my 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 thought was I'm going to help him. I'm going to keep his family in their house. And keep his wife and kids safe, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try and help him. And so, from the money end of it, that's what I was doing. You know, physically, I was trying to be with him. You know, there's, you know, he'd steal a lot of stuff. There was times at nights when Heather was gone that you know I'd go down there and he'd have one of the guns he'd stolen from me, and he was threatening to kill himself. And I'd go stay all night with him and take the guns back home with me and stuff. You know, and it was just it was it was a different time. You know, it was weird. But you did everything that you knew to do. Well, and, and, I, and, and I don't know that I would do anything different. You know, I love my kids, and and uh, I, w I was doing it. And this is the hard part because of the way it turned out. Because for the whole time, I was enabling is what I was told. And, yeah, I'm sure I was, you know, because I was paying their, keeping their house payment paid or, or keeping them kind of things going. And Heather was working for me, and I was trying to, you know, to make sure they had enough money to survive and... And, uh, and so he's doing all that, you know, and when I'd find out about my guns, when I'd get the money, I'd go buy him back and lock him up, and then he'd figure out how to get him or whatever again, you know. And um, But then, you know, towards the end, so, so this is hard to know what I should have done because, and I still don't know, and, but I don't know that I'd do anything different, but at the end, you know, we our family, we got together and we talked about it and Jed wasn't there and we talked about that I had to quit enabling him and uh, get tougher on him and, and so we sat down with him when he came all the family and told him uh, well I wasn't going to do that anymore and if he used drugs anymore we was gonna, or stole anything we was going to turn him in and get him arrested but you know that it really went south from there really yeah. bad you know and so Continue, continue to enable him was not the answer. Doing that wasn't the answer in his case. Um, lots of people said, well, when they hit rock bottom, they're going to change, you know, and he had a couple thought, we thought rock bottom times, and he changed for a minute, you know, or he wanted to go to rehab. I mean, I went, when Barbara broke her hip, you know, just, just before that, just the, the year before, um, he, he was on drugs and he was selling drugs and getting fake prescriptions from doctors and all kinds of stuff. And uh, we're all sitting in the lobby and we're all there because Barbara broke her hip and all my kids come, including, were in my room in, including him. We actually were out in the lobby talking about this with him before we talked to you guys uh -huh. in the room. Okay. And uh, he was in trouble with somebody because of money. And that was it put him in a place that he... He opened up to us and started talking about his drug use then. And uh, I don't know if it was because he was scared for his family mm -hmm. or what, you know, because he he had to get this money back to these people or they was going to 
do something bad. You know, he was already looking for him or something. So that kind of got him to where he wanted to go to rehab and stuff for him. And the first rehab happened right after that. And, you know, we got the people paid, whatever, you know. But uh, so he was good for, you know, it wasn't very long. It was only a few months, and then he'd be back where he was. You know, and, and from a, from our perspective, we didn't know when he was and when he wasn't. You know, he'd come and act the part, you know, that he was being good. But, but you know, after not very long, he was, you know, and after a few times of that, we could tell better, you know. He's, we were learning how it, how it was, but, uh, um, yeah, and so it was a, it was a roller coaster, you know. It was up and down and all kinds of stuff, and. And Becca, my oldest daughter, Becca, of course, was really close to him. So she was, it was mostly me and her that were being part of that part of his life where we kind of knew, kind of knew what was going on, trying to get him through it, trying to help him. You know, he would be more open to us than the others in the family. I was hiding. You know, the, the other kids were all like, you know, thought I was crazy and that I was being stupid and doing the wrong thing and. They were pretty vocal to me about it, you know. And I was so. just in my own little world thinking that everything was going to be just fine. I was trying. Just going to gonna get better, you know. So. I was just trying to keep home normal and, and. And there was nothing wrong with that. I mean, we were trying know. to do. Well, there was. We I feel was very right guilty time, about that. Know? So, you know, you don't know where to be. You don't know whether you should be there holding their hand or whether you should be the one that's pretending with them that everything's okay. You or know or you're the one being tough should, on them, I, you know? I didn't know where to be. So well, it's hard to figure that out as a parent because you do the best you can with what you've been given. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's personalities are different, so yeah. what would work on one kid won't work on another. Right. Right. Well, and as, as a dad, you know, I, lots of dads are I feel I think feel this way. You're trying to fix the things your kids are doing wrong, or fix their problems, or you want to help them no matter what they're doing, no no matter what it is, whether it's this or something yeah. simpler, you know, or if they need something. You're always trying to help them and. It's unconditional love. It is, yeah. Oh, it is. You know. Love them no matter what. But uh, on the same note, when I was doing that, I feel like I hurt Becca, too, because <laughs> I wish I would have taken that responsibility rather than her, because I think it's it's been tough on her. So I wish we wouldn't have put as much on her either. So, But you did the best you could, and that's why well, you... I baked cookies and smiled a lot, <laughs> you know? Well, that's, that's got you through it, and that's, that's what got I like, like Barb's cookies. <laughs> yeah, they are good, yeah. I like Barb's cookies. Yeah. Barb, I love you for more than that, but I do love your cookies. <laughs> <laughs> well, you. So, So things took a turn for the worst in 2014. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and, and, you know, it was, it, was, it was crazy, because I know a lot about that day that that I've shared now, you know, but uh, the day he took his life, but, uh, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd went to a rehab up in, you know, at Sherwood Hills, is that what it's yeah, called? Right. Right. Sardine Sardine Canyon. Canyon. He went up to, in Sardine Canyon, went to a rehab there, and, and you know, he was doing pretty good, and, and uh, well, we'd go up and see him on weekends, and Heather would come, and the kids, you know, sometimes, depending on how it worked out, and we went one weekend, and President Dalton went with us and we took him to church and with a bunch of the other people we took them too to church with us and things seemed to be going okay and and what, what, you know after a couple months because he was there quite a while maybe after a month we all went and met God and went to, went to Brigham City for his birthday and went to the park our whole family went and hung out and things were, were going good and uh, it was like the next week that he told Heather that you know that he wanted, didn't want her anymore and and that this was happening because of the rehab and you know and they they had some special thing you know and we didn't know what was going on you know but they ended up having meeting a girl there but someone had come from california to teach him some classes and it totally switched him totally, totally switched, switched him, him and he i wish i would know what was said because he changed but he you know he and it made him whatever happened there and i don't, I don't really know whether it was just the girl whether something they did, but he changed to where it was really just about Jed now, you know, which was never him. That wasn't him at all. You know, it was just about Jed. He got to where that all he cared about was him, at least for a short time there. Just a short it time. It changed back. He changed a short time. back. So anyway, Heather went and lived with her mom and the kids did, and he came to Twila, and, and that girl was there for a short time, but he was really, he really struggled right then because when he came home and, well, she wasn't there, and 
and he had this and, and it just didn't work out. You know, the girl, new girlfriend and him torn apart because he didn't have his kids and his family. So, uh, amazingly, you know, I, that didn't last very long and she was gone, the girl. And he was alone, alone for a while in the home. And that's during that alone time was when a lot of these things happened when I was going over there and he was kind of suicidal. He was alone. He didn't have Heather or the kids either. Didn't have the other girl in which he didn't, he'd kind of decided he didn't want her. And, uh, and then after a little while, Heather came back and came back and they were together again with the kids. And, but the drug use was back too. And, uh, so she, they move back, and the kids. You know, I mean, she's a saint to be to do that and yeah, be with amazing, him. Yeah, amazing girl. And so that, and that was I'm trying to think. It was the fall of the year when the the, the, the cat. Well, during when he went to rehab, and then, and then Heather left, and it was sometime later in the year. I think it was just before Christmas that she came back in, and her and the kids, and they they seemed to kind of try to work it out, you know, and. And, uh, but then he started using drugs and we knew he was, and he was taking all the money. There was no money left again, you know, and stealing stuff again. And, uh, she was and, yeah, and, and she was just doing things and she was working for me because that's the only money she could control really. Because, because he was a, he was a functioning drug addict because he still went to work every day, had his job and made the money to, to, to pay the bills. But instead of using it to pay the bills, he was using it, you know, after like the first day. For the check, there might be something you could use that day, but the next day the money was gone because he'd paid all of this check for drugs and whatever, or old old bills for drugs or whatever. So or paying people that he needed to pay. Uh, yeah, what, you know all the things. So he stay out of trouble. Um, <laughs> and so they were behind on on bills, and uh, and this was like you know you file your income tax, and they're expecting their income tax, and it really came down to you know he was angry and he was trying to. He said he was still trying to get off drugs, and some days he'd tell us he's not using, and but he was drinking a lot, and you know, he was trying. I don't, to I don't know what to believe as far you know. Barbara believes that he was off drugs when he when he took I his did. life, but I, I don't know that I believe that or not. But it doesn't it doesn't really matter because it, it is what it is. But during that time, you know, he was it was just still crazy. And yeah. it was he was going to have a drug test for his job the next. Like on a month, well, the yeah, the, day. The, so that may have been part of it too. Yeah, the England Construction was going to do a, a, drug a test. government and job, and then he was going to have this. So they had to be drug job. tests for the government job. Yeah, because he he stopped working at Excel during that time. Went to work just for the England Construction because they were growing and getting big, and so they needed full time help. So he was doing that, and uh, but he was still spending all their money on drugs, alcohol. On, well, drugs or alcohol, whatever. whatever it was. I think it was a drug still because it was a lot of money. You know, and so, but but whatever it was, um, and then, <laughs> so they they got their one income tax return and he'd spend it all. But the other one came, and he didn't know. And uh, this was on Friday, and she was at work, and I and I she looked and all it's in my account. And I said, well, don't tell Jed, so we can use it for bills. Well, she ended up somehow he found out that I told her not to tell him, and he was upset. And so he's really upset at me and he's really upset at Heather and turned into a big giant fight that day. And, you know, that, this was kind of just what happened at the end. But uh, Heather, and this is the last, this is the, you know, 22nd of February. He's upset at me that night. He's upset at me in the morning. He's yelling at me on the phone. He's yelling at Heather and Heather had had enough. And so she left that day. With the kids. And he With went chasing out and trying to get the kids. Yeah. It was sad. And so the, anyway, she ended up coming to our house with her and the kids and uh, and he'd been upset and he uh, I was outside doing something in the yard and he called and he talked called, to Barb and talked to me and and he and said is Heather and the in. kids there mom and, and they, I they had just walked in the door and I'm not a good liar and I I went I just was like um no and he said they're there and so I, my last chance I talked to him was kind of. So then I talked to him on the phone after that, and he was mad at me for about the money. You know, I'm sure he needed to, to pay whatever, you know, but um, he was mad at me about the money. Uh, he was totally upset. He was yelling at me on the phone, and I'm sick of it. And 
I'm, uh, I'm just going to end it, you know, and that kind of thing. And, and so... So we went to a church dinner. Is that where you're so, at? No, I'm almost there. Oh, okay. So, so he says that, and, uh, and then hangs up the phone on me. And uh, and so you don't really know what to do when you go down there or whatever. So <clears throat> so we call the police to maybe do like a well check or something. But they and this was you know early on in. That kind of stuff in twelve, I guess, and uh, they just pretty much told us that uh, just to give him time, and he'd be okay, he'd, you know, that he'd calm down and whatever, and which, you know, I guess I tended to believe it, so I tried. That's what we did, and so Heather, you know, Heather was there, and we didn't go down, and this is like at four o'clock in the afternoon or something, and obviously he went ahead and did it within minutes of that. You know, but uh, we went to, uh, me and Barbara went to a church thing we was planning on going to. Which was very we, miserable because we both had the gut feeling that something, was, something was not right. So we left that early and went, just went to his house and that's when we found him. We found him. That he'd, that he'd shot himself. And, and uh, yeah, that really hard. And Heather was with her, with the kids in Grantsville and at their mom's house. and. And so, uh, but Sheriff Limmer and some other people the, the, there we called that the were police wonderful. and they came down and uh, that's something my mommy's never supposed to see. And that was really, really, really hard to find him and and uh, that you know, but uh, so that, that was really hard. But you know, now that now that we went through all that and uh, and this is what happened. Um, there, there's, there's both sides of it because I miss him bad. But uh, More okay. if he was still doing the same thing, I'd rather him be with Heavenly Father in heaven and, and being safe and yeah, we know he's okay. And not here. But if he could have changed, I would have learned him here. But so I don't know. So yeah. <laughs> so that that's how that happened and. And uh, after that, uh, well, I tend to work my problems out, just go to work, you know. So he died Saturday night, and we had a lot of people. And, you know, our state presidents here, friends of mine, they came over and visited us that night. And, but I was the bishop of the ward at that time. Now, if a normal person would just stay home and not go to church and do their thing, well, I'm not normal, so... The next morning I go to my meetings and go to church and my family knows that I'm doing that. So they actually came to sacrament meeting, but after the sacrament meeting we left and, and the struggles after that of mourning, you know, Barbara seemed to handle it better than I did because I pretty much shut down for a while and I, I still worked and I went and did my thing, but I didn't, I wasn't really there and I was not taking take care of things personally for me, you know, I was just falling apart, so. And uh, Barbara seemed to do better at that than me. She, she lets things out and talks, and I accuse her of talking too much, but uh, she, she, she says what's in her head comes out of her mouth, and, and, uh, she's, and she's like that. And it's, it's, a good, it's a good thing, mostly, you know, so. But in that case, it was definitely a good thing, because she could talk to people, and and let her grief out and talk about her grief and so we struggled yeah and i was the opposite i wanted to, to talk and, and i didn't want to talk i didn't want to talk about it i didn't want to talk about it i didn't want to talk to anybody about it and i just kept it inside me and uh and so with good friends and stuff that kept me going you know like you like you and you were there to crack a joke or whatever and keep me going but uh it really took me to decide that i had to Stop doing what I was doing because after a few months, you know, the businesses were, we was already struggling a little bit because we was all, we was trying to keep Jed afloat, you know, but uh, I was, we just weren't doing anything because I wasn't functioning, you know, and so 
I just decided I had to just get over it and go back. Well, you and never had to, get I had over to, it. You have to well, get over it enough different. that I could still function. You have to handle it. And quit just uh, just being a zombie and just going around showing up where I was supposed to show up but not really doing anything, you know. I know one thing that um, at times like that, you know the Heavenly Father's there and you know that he's helping you. I, I could have never done it without him. And just the simple fact that I have a testimony of the Savior and know that my dad's okay. Um, Luck, luckily, our family, we, I mean, we didn't, you know, there's nobody to blame, really. You know, we blame ourselves and still do. Um, you know, Barbara and me have our things we blame ourselves about and still do. It's hard to let it go. And we know, we really do know that it's not our fault. We do know that, but it's still hard to not. Them little things that I just talked about, you know, that uh, happened. You know, I still wish that I'd done it different, you know. And would it have been better? But would you just tell me this? If I would have kept going now and he was still alive, would you still be doing the same thing? Right. And who would he be hurting? I mean, he wouldn't want to hurt anyone anyway. So who would it be hurting? He'd rather not, you know. And so, you know, I, I, I think about all them things. And so, yeah, and so that's, I don't know what we missed. I'm sure we missed half of the half the things we wanted to say, but that's that's the gist of it, you know. Well, you know, and you talk about how you each individually handled the grief and I think that's I think that's common that grief has stages and and you don't go from one stage to the other at the same time. And uh you know it's it's tough when you're going through grief and maybe one person seems to be having a okay day and the other one's not having an okay day and and there's so many stumbling blocks to get through that that you guys did everything right. It just is a crappy deal and it's it's you you get through those stages at different times. You might not even be on the same stage at the same time, but you get through it. And I remember I think it was Barb, I think Barb said to me, because I asked you if, how you were doing one day, how are you doing, how are you hanging in, and you said to me, I'm, I'm okay because I at least know he's safe. Yeah, it's kind of like when you're a mommy and at the end of the day you get to tuck your little kids in bed and, and uh, snuggle them and say prayers with them and you know that they're okay. And it's kind of like that. And I go out at night and just look up in the sky and I have a star that's my dad and we have some good visits. I, I have good visits with Heavenly Father about him. I know he's okay. I know he's okay. So that's how I deal with it. And our faith has helped us because of what we believe, you know, our our, our faith, our faith, you know, in, in our Father in Heaven and Jesus Christ. And so that's really what's helped us through is knowing that He's okay. Right. It doesn't necessarily make us okay, but it makes Him okay. We know that He's okay where He's at and He's safe and, and we get to see Him again and it's not the end, you know. Yeah, and it is a good feeling because we have, we know people that think if someone commits <clears throat> Oh, no, doesn't commit. What are we supposed to say? Uh, if someone dies by suicide, that they're, they go to hell or whatever. That's their belief. And I know that that's why we have the Savior. Um, Heavenly Father loves us all. And so he gave us a Savior to make that better. And I know he made that better for us. So. Well, you know, and our friend uh, Nathan Osmond. Yeah. He had, he had mentioned um, on his episode of the podcast that he had lost a cousin, you know, Marie Osmond's son, <clears throat> had taken his life and, and died by suicide. And, and I believe it was uh, Thomas S. Monson spoke at the funeral and said that he wanted them to know that, that when people make that decision to end their life, most of the times they're so clouded mentally that they're not held responsible for their actions. And so yeah. he let them know that they would be with their cousin again. And so, I mean, that, That's a good that is good to know. It is a yeah. good feeling. Well, I'm not a doomsday person, and I'm not a demon person. But um, the day I talked to Jed's neighbor, and she said the day that he took his life, she could feel demons in between his bedroom wall and her house, and they wouldn't penetrate. They couldn't penetrate her home. 
And she said it was about four o'clock. They were all gone. And so that's when we assume about the time that he took his life. So I think that that is true. I think sometimes when we can't handle, Heavenly Father said, if you can't handle it, he'd take over. Kind of like the, the foots in the sand, the footprints in the sand. And I think he did. I think he took my boy and carried him. Yeah, so. I don't believe that. Well, I appreciate you sharing it. I know it's not an easy story to tell. And there's so many people that might not have known some of the details. And, and uh, But I think it was... I think it was shortly after that, within the next week or mm-hmm. so, that uh, um, Becca had talked to me about what she was going through and the struggles she was having. And she had said to me, I wish, you know, there was something you could do to make sure that that nobody ever had to go through that. And out of the loss of Jed, I mean, I'd much rather you have Jed Right. But out of the loss of Jed, some good things have come from it. Yeah. Um, for those of you that don't know or, or aren't in Tooele County, it was because of the loss of Jed and, an, and another boy that, uh, that died a day apart that we started the foundation to try to hopefully make it so that nobody else had to go through that pain and, and the grief and the suffering of of losing someone they love to, to suicide. And it, it seems like we started putting together the plan to, to start the foundation fairly quickly. And it took, yeah, about, you're awesome. Took about nine months. Yeah, I know you, you spearheaded not, that. You know what? I'll never Becca forget. was part of it a little bit, but uh-huh. mostly you really spearheaded you that. You were it. Going, yeah. And she I'll really never, wanted to make something good out of her, her brothers. Yeah. Yes, she did. she did. She did. And that was amazing. But I'll never forget <laughs> that you had a dream or something and you woke up and you said that you life's worth living that you wanted it to be named life's worth living because of the christmas it's a it's a wonderful it's life. a wonderful life and now tell us that tell me because i'm having a brain cramp <laughs> i'm um, old barb i don't know yes, i remember was, having the name come to me of life it's a living. wonder and it's a wonderful life and we talked about that movie and because it's a wonderful li- yeah, yeah the movie it's a wonderful life and, and so we decided to start doing the it's a wonderful life festival yes yes because everybody that's seen that christmas movie knows there's a tie to suicide or an attempt and right and uh so yeah i would say I would I would say there's been lots of help from the other side because where would that come from right we didn't know what we were doing when we started it and <laughs> it seems like every move we made were there mistakes in getting to where we are sure but so much of it was handed over pretty easy to to make it work and yeah. and yeah. I remember <laughs> I remember we had never been to We'd never been to a support group or to know what any of that was like. Never been to a AA meeting or or any of those things at the time in 2014. And and Becca and I'd had a discussion and said, well, we should do that. We should do that and have Barb bring cookies. (laughs) (laughs) That's the one thing I can do. I can bring cookies. And I said, well, I... I wouldn't know how to run that. I wouldn't have an idea how to do it. And, And Becca said... Who could we get? And I said, you know what? Your parents would be perfect for that. And so I remember stopping at the shop, and I remember coming into Ed and saying, "So uh, I got a question for you." And he goes, "What?" And I said, uh, "He's always asking me to do dumb things." Yeah, I'm always, and he always points out their dumb things. Thanks, Ed. I appreciate that. Wasn't that wasn't a dumb thing. <laughs> and so I said, uh, "How would you feel about?" handling starting and running a suicide support group out here and i believe he didn't say just no i think it was a hell no and yeah. and uh, <laughs> probably he said yeah no i'm i'm not doing it i'm i, I think yeah, you're pretty I, direct i was and i really didn't think i wanted to do it yeah. i really didn't i just was like i don't really want to do this this is your thing you know 
because I was I was not there really at that yeah, point. Yeah, you weren't it, ready. I wasn't ready, but it, it only took me a minute. Yeah, and a couple of weeks, and I changed my mind. But what what Ed didn't realize was that I could sell ice to an Eskimo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, when you ask somebody and they give you a no, you just rephrase it and ask again. Yeah. <laughs> and when they say no the next time, you figure out a different way to rephrase it and you ask again, and finally, you said. I'll try. I'll, we'll give it a shot. Yeah, give it a shot. Yeah. Um, when we had to find a place to do it, and you know, before that, you know, I knew that you was working on it, and but I really told Becca, I, I just really, you know, yeah, you, you're good. You guys just take care of it. You know, I'm good without helping you. <laughs> but but the other side of that was, you know, you know me, I will do anything for my kids. Mm-hmm. And I really think it was even though you asked, it was Becca talking to me, yeah. also that we got me to say, okay, I'll help you. So tell us, uh, uh, tell us your thoughts uh, when you when you had that first first meeting where you actually s- saw people that well, were we, struggling. We didn't, like you say, we didn't know what to do. Yeah, we told and our we, story, we, and then well, everyone started telling. Yeah, but we didn't we, ahead of that. We didn't really know how to run a meeting or what to do or what to talk about. And I think you had talked to somebody, and I had asked somebody, and we. We really went to our first meeting just kind of winging it, you know, and we didn't have a place, so we was able to use the LDS church, and and uh, you, you, Mr. Social Media Guy, you was advertising it, and and uh, and we went to our first meeting, and there was like five or six kids that showed up, you know, all friends, mm-hmm. but they all showed up, and we were there, and you guys were there, and Becca was there, and... Uh, I, maybe that was it, but I can't remember. But uh, it was really quite amazing, and uh, we got some kids talking that were know, having and, some problems. Yeah, and for you, for you to get me to do what I'm doing now is really unusual, because <laughs> because I don't I don't share. I just don't. I keep it all in, I, and that's just the way I've always been. And you can ask Barbara. I don't like to talk about anything about me. I don't like to talk about personal things. I like to keep them to myself, and so. I go there, and uh, these boys, these boys are there, and the girls is with them, and and especially the one of them, you know, was really was really suicidal at the time, and uh, they all they all had it seemed like they all had experiences with depression and and suicidal thoughts, and and. Uh, and they're yeah. all in their early twenties. Yeah, yes, just, I didn't they realize just, that they were just really you know, young them. adults. They were just you know. Yeah. Uh, it seemed like they had their whole world ahead of them, but they were really lost. Really, yeah, just struggling, and so that was that, that was our first meeting, and we and we visited for a couple hours. They were very talkative and shared their thoughts and their stories, and they didn't really hold back much. And and uh, we became we we talked about our story a little bit. I don't think that first time I shared much of mine. You know, um, Barbara, like you say, Barbara's more open; she can talk about it. And, but we just all talked about it. We talked. I think we spent more time talking about them, mm-hmm. but then they wanted to go do a bonfire yeah. with you the same week. They had to go drink yeah. beer that week. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was Dr. Pepper. <laughs> we Dr. Pepper around the their fire. beer was Dr. Pepper, 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 so we went up the yeah. canyon and had a and fire, did a bonfire, and sat around and hung out with them and and uh, drank Dr. Pepper and, and had a good time. But that, we we developed some great friendship with them. And we're still friends since with. then. Still, still with them. We don't we don't see him always. He spent her occasionally, you know, and. Of course, one of them ended up did taking his life last year. The end did, but uh, um, but it, it took that to start happening because it really this really this work has really helped me because I found out that you need to share your feelings I and then and then it would help. Yeah. So how quickly did you notice that? Right away, huh? It wasn't really right away. You know, I, at first I didn't share. I think. Uh, at the church, I didn't share a whole lot. You know, we did have a little bit, and I would, I would try and share my story, but I really struggled wanting to wanting to do that. You know, because it just, just not my personality. And uh, but a lot of different things we was trying as we was going along, learning about support group and how to do it and whatever. And and so, but you know, within within a few months, I realized that I started sharing more and sharing my feelings inside of me more. And Barbara was sharing her feelings all the time. She would always tell the story and. Well, and, and, and how she felt. Go ahead. I think I approached those boys um, as a mother, like <clears throat> like how I felt 
when my boy did that. So, you know, love your family in. And, and it is kind of a selfish thing to do, you know, but it's not at the same time because you can't control that. So I think I tried to influence them and say, you know, take more time. Think about, you know, don't just rush into anything like that. And I, I really think I was over at the, when we moved over to the TTC and we was having, there was having a lot more people come. And uh, I, I started realizing that I needed to share share more often and share my feelings and let it out because it did help me. And, and, and sometime during that first few months, I realized that the, really the best thing you can do is talk about it. I remember the night that he finally told the story and he was a, a new person. And I, it, to me, I felt, I felt a big weight lifted and I knew that he was glad he'd shared. And, but that was when we were meeting at the hospital. Right? No, it was, it was, was college, it at the, college. Was it still at the college? college? Yeah. Okay. But anyway, I just really remember the relief that you felt when you'd finally let it out. I felt like I had my husband back. Because, yeah. Because, uh, you know, I'm really private, so, and, and I still am about lots of things, and I don't like people knowing stuff about me, but, and so to share that was hard for me, but I realized how good that was to make me feel, and then it made me more passionate with the people in the support group about you need to share and you need to let your feelings out. You need to talk about what's going on so that because just talking about it helps. And, uh, and I think that's a major key to everybody. Talking. Talking helps. Because when I tell the story, I feel like it's not a hidden, deep, dark, terrible spot anymore. It's a it's a help to someone else. It's I'm not high I don't hide I don't hide things. I'm not good at it anyway. I need to tell. I just, I, I've never been a good liar. <laughs> I've never been a good teaser. I mean, I just, I, my, I wear my feelings on my shirt sleeve, I guess. And, and mm -hmm. so it's kind of weird that Eddie and I get along so well. Because <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the opposite of that when it comes yeah. to them kind of things. Well, yeah. I remember, I remember back when we were meeting at the college, having the support group at the college and, I remember coming in, stopping in the shop to see you uh, midweek or something, and, and you told me, I really think it's helping me. Yeah. I remember you telling me that, saying, you know, I don't yeah. like to do that, but it is it's really it's really helping me. And and I, I don't think you've got nearly the credit that you deserve because you've you took something out of thin air and built that, and you know. Prior to COVID-19, we were having pretty large groups yeah. at a support group meeting. And one of the things that shocks me the most is six, almost seven years later, we still have kids coming that came to that initial meeting yeah. just to check yeah. in and make sure everybody else is okay. Yeah. And it's supposed to feel like a, a family, yeah. it, you know, because yeah. you love each and every one of those people. Yes. And yeah. it's, it's sort of crazy that we all came together. And we knew it was a safe space. Yeah. It yeah. was safe space. When you and came it, in and, and talked. people talk, from everywhere. It's not just. All know, walks of all life. Walks all life all walks all of life. Of things. And, yeah. And we, we do become that family. Yeah. And, yeah, and we care we about do. each other, love each other, and want to help each other. It's really Amazing that what that has done in that support group, and yeah. we've had a lot of different people, and we have lots of them that just keep coming. Other ones that come back once in a while to just check and check on us, make sure that we're doing the right thing, or or to just because just because they care and they and they miss us and love us, and uh, but it's it's really been a good thing. And and you're right, it, we had no idea what we we're doing. We've had some trainings now. Yeah, you know, and we got now we know we got training. Right? <laughs> we, we know better what we're doing, and, and sometimes we really don't do it like the training because. What we've developed it into really works for us. Yeah. And so it's not really exactly like the, the training say, but it is part of that. And that has helped us to maybe say things correctly and, and so we're not hurting somebody or whatever. But, uh, but it, it really does work pretty well. And, and people enjoy it to come, you know, and, and they get a chance to share their feelings. And, you know, and you know that we have lots of them come that the first time especially they don't really feel like they're sharing. But it seems like some of them at the beginning of the meeting are sharing by the well, end. By, by the end, then they're then they're, they've sad. opened up and yeah. feel like they're comfortable to share. So yeah. it's and I hope that they feel comfortable to be able to come and not share and yeah. be able to just listen yeah. to. You don't have to you don't have to come and talk. It's just sometimes just, you know, to be able to listen and know. 
And I think it does help, you know, people say you have people that have attempted and then you have people that are survivors um, and, and, and you mix them. And I think that it's really good that we've mixed them because I think it it is. And it's great to have people there that have like us that we've never attempted, but our sons actually did it. We're survivors. And And then the kids there, or the people there, not just kids, but the people there that are thinking of attempting or whatever, at least can see how we feel. Yeah. Well, that's the one thing that, that, you know, because we, in those trainings, they'd say, well, have one for survivors and then have one for the kids that are having ideation. And and <clears throat> the one thing that I think works about the way we do it is take yourselves, for instance. Maybe you didn't know what to say at the time that you experienced a right. suicide in your family. Right. But you've had seven years now. Yeah. Well, and now when somebody comes in, you've kind of got those thoughts already in your head and you can tell them the things that you would have told Jed had you could yeah. right. could have said it now. One, one thing we should have been way more open, you know, and, and that's, that's what we talk about is because we, we walked around and like, Eggshells. Like, like we're pretending like it, was it wasn't pretend. happening, you know, you know, or something, you know, we, we, yeah. we didn't confront it as much as we probably should have. Yeah. And I think that's common too. Yeah. Um, yeah. You don't want to believe Maybe that. if we ignore it, it'll go away. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I'm grateful that Eddie, through those meetings, I don't know what would have happened had he not realized he could tell people and let it out. Because he wasn't fun. No, well, after I decided <laughs> after that first three months, I finally decided I had to go function at all. At least yeah. I, yeah, I was better. Mm-hmm. I was better. I still wasn't the same, and I'd never be the same. Oh no! But uh, I was better. I, I went to work and I worked hard and got everything going back like it should be again. You know, and doing doing taking care of work and my family and, and church callings and the different things I'm involved in. You know and. But yeah, the, the support group definitely has been a healing thing for both of us. And do you think that your family's dynamics changed since then? Yes. Or has it stayed the same? You to know, a certain point, that, or you got more close, or well, not you know, as close? Well, uh, initially, you know, it's different with different kids, you know, and most of, all but, you know, Becca was, was part of the foundation and, and, and still thinks it's a great thing, but my kids really didn't want anything to do with the foundation. And they didn't. Then they just thought, you know. And, and Zeb still hasn't figured out his feelings. Yeah. And even it's, after all these years, he still struggles with that. You know. Of course, they were best friends. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he just doesn't want to talk about it. Period. Kind of like I was. And yeah. uh, you know, his wife can occasionally get him to talk about it, but he really struggles with it. And so, it, it's affected our family, you know. And uh, and you know that luckily Heather's the the angel that she is, you know, because. At least we have them still part of our family. Oh, she they because are a big part of our family. They come still. and, I mean, you know, she's with another a man and they live wherever. And, and he, Trent, is you wonderful. Know, is wonderful, just like he's part of our family, really. He, nice and, and he, he is, And she she comes to us and, you know, well. They come up here for their birthday parties to our yeah, house. Yeah, and we have their birthday parties, you know. We was worried that what would happen, you know, with our grandkids and that, would we see them and. Because a lot that, of and that, lot of people, and that really has never changed. Right, no. a lot of people in that before. situation would have just taken the kids so and went to her family's and never come. So we didn't. Back we didn't lose family, that. You know, we didn't lose that family. We but our families struggled. But Beck, Brooke and Jake has finally come more around to what we're trying to do, and then changes, and, uh, want, and and don't mind being part of what we do now. You know, and just this last year, really. Yeah. You know, yeah. just uh, Jake walked to Wendover yeah. with us and, yeah. went and brought yeah. his family. Yeah. And, and Brooke's kids did. You know, they were out of town, but Brooke's kids and they were going to walk to Wendover with us yeah. this year. And they were all going to do that. Them two families, and that's they're finally opening up to that. And, and Jed's kiddos have walked with oh, us. Yeah. They love yeah. it. And that's Multiple my favorite times. part of uh, really my very very favorite part was walking the first time with uh, Wyatt. Wyatt and and um, and. Yes. Just watching that. It broke my heart with him having his dad on the back of his shirt. Yeah. But in the same sense, he was he proud was to walk very proud. for his dad. And it will always be my favorite memories. And then the next year, the other oh, the two came. Thing. And yeah. it's always my favorite to watch those kids walk. My, it, my favorite memory of, of Wyatt was we walked 100 miles to Window. <laughs> yeah. I walked straight. 
Why is zigzag? He had to done 200 miles to wind over. <laughs> zigzag and back and forth across the street. And then we got back and we wanted to walk home. Yeah, and then when yes. we were ready to head back on the Sunday in the tour buses or yes. whatever in the van, he says, Grandma, can't we walk back? Yeah, he wanted to walk back. And I think we counted 800 and something bottles on the road yeah. as we were walking. And, he, and coming home on Sunday, we, we, we was in the van and with him, you know, because we drag the porta potty but we, we came back but he's still all the way home he says we gotta walk you know so, we, so I dropped him off about three blocks before yeah. the, the city hall and let him walk that and and walk, walk, walk that last little we bit we walked just, the last little bit I got like, pictures of you walking that last yeah, little bit it was he was amazing means. and the other thing that's amazing is every walk we've had a butterfly or something significant be with Come us land on the kids. and land on the kids. This last year, a big mm-hmm. monarch butterfly landed in the, remember it landed yeah. in the box of chips and they just know that their daddy is sending a signal that he knows what they're doing watching. and he's watching over them. And this last time they came out, I went and bought little photo albums for each of them and let them go through his pictures and make themselves books of their dad yeah. because they're so important to him. And a really cute little note, um, they were. They had a big fire across the street from their home, and Hunter called me and she said, "Grandma, in Vale. This was in Vale, next to St. George." And she called me and I said, "Hi, Auntie, how are you?" And she said, "Not very good, Grandma." And she said, "We have a big fire across the street." And she said, "But I went in my bedroom and I've got all my daddy's things, in my special box, and I've got it in the car." So the kids, Jed is a very big part of the kids' lives. And I thank Trent all the time for taking care. I tell him that I know Jed is grateful that he's taking care of his kids for him because he's not here to do it. But Trent's teaching them manners and he's teaching them. He's helping with their homework. He's doing things that Jedediah can't do. And I know that he's really thankful for that. And and he's become part of our family. Trent and his son have become part of our family. Stetson is one of our grandkids now, too. And so they've just all become part of our family. But, you know, you guys are such wonderful people. That's why you they're embracing you guys, because not people wouldn't have embraced her either. So I think you guys got to pat yourselves on the back, because you guys are such loving people that you all can come together and love each other. And, and Well, those babies are all a piece of Jed, and they all look like him. Although <laughs> Jed and Heather look alike. When they went to the temple, the temple sealer thought that they, he said, are you sure you're not brother and sister? Because they look so much alike. So the kids... You know, um, we're, we're really blessed with our, our daughter-in-laws because they just feel like they're our kids, you know, yeah. and all of them. And uh, they're, just, they're nice. just good, and we just feel like they're our kids, you know. Yeah. We, we, they, nice. we just love them. Well, like Tracy was saying, Ed knows this because I've told Ed probably at least a thousand times. I'm like, Ed's my idol. Uh-huh. So when you look at somebody and go, that's the dad I'm going to be, it's, yeah. it's Ed. And he is. He's a good dad. I'll always tell He's me, yeah, you're getting father of the year, father of the year. But <laughs> you know what? Of the year. Everybody, my kids are saying, why can't he yeah. be my grandpa? Yeah. <laughs> Serious, we'll sell him to you. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, but, but the fact the that you guy. kept your family so close, and you really have, yeah, you're going to have squabbles and you're going to have fights and and silly things that really are just silly things are. that are a big deal at a moment but but you guys you kept them so stick close. together and you love each other we yeah. love them we love our we family love to pieces we're so blessed and i'm so thankful we are, we are lucky that our kids so. are yeah. here and we can be close and, we, and it's important to us you know so yeah we work hard at it now it's your turn huh? and it, yes and i wasn't going to be on this podcast well see so you're supposed to be no but that's it's embarrassing. You're not making me cry. But you know, now that because I love you guys. <laughs> now you know. Kudos to you with this. I mean, the foundation because yes, thank really, you, you have worked so, so hard at it and made it what it is. Today. You guys really, are awesome. We've been a little bit part of it. And we've helped. I mean, you know, like that uh, support group. Yeah, with your guidance, we made it what it is. But Life Worth Living Foundation is. You know, you've done the hard work and you've yes. made it happen. And you keep it going. And, thank and you. Without you, it make people going. And, and it's a blessing in our lives. And you know. It's, Serving as your helper is pretty easy, you know, because you're just a hard worker. See, <laughs> and so thank you. You helped us, and you helped Eddie. Yeah. Get out of, I mean, so 
Yeah. If so you would have ever thought that it was a great idea to walk 100 miles. Oh, yeah. so, I know. It is a good yeah. awesome. Well, when he, when he wanted good. to walk down I-80 100 now, miles. Now, what did you tell me then? That it was about the dumbest thing I ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> we could get somebody hurt because he wanted to walk down I-80. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when he came back with the front end road idea, it wasn't so bad. Yeah. I still yeah, thought, I thought, it, was, I still I thought, thought it was crazy. dumb. <laughs> I still thought it was dumb. I really did never think it would ever pan out. I tell you what, tell you what, it is. there is something about that walk of being with them people that heals you. It, it really does. And I'm not walking. I'm just driving the van, watching you people and having my time to think. But it's healing for me. Well, and it's anybody, healing for Barbara yes, and it's healing it for my grandkids that walk. Uh, when and the I other walk, people there, they tell us. I mean, that's it's an amazing event that you came up with. And it, it's our best event. I mean, it's, it is. It's everybody's really favorite as, event. As dumb as it was. I mean, it has well, no idea that the trick was to get him to come so I could have that on recording. <laughs> <laughs> After he gave me so much crap about what a dumb idea it was. I said it was a dumb idea. I said, you're well, crazy. If anybody still told me while I'm asleep that I walked 23 miles in two days, I would laugh at him because I don't think I could ever do that. But yeah. for you some reason, it happens. Yeah. It happens. And she's walked more now. So and I think it's interesting is we're out there in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the, de- the desert. Yes. And, and we're so walking. Beautiful. That you hear stories and go, wow. Yeah. You know, some, I, there's something about that. You can think that you've got it worse <laughs> than everybody. And then you can hear a story and go, wow. Uh, you yeah. know? Yes. I think and we learn we want our own problems. Everybody's right. got them, Right. Right. Yeah. It's, and so, and in the middle of nowhere, it's so beautiful. Yeah. I can't believe how beautiful it is, and it it really isn't a beautiful spot, but it is. It's beautiful. The desert and, and just being out there and having That's time amazing. to think and walk and yeah, yeah. hang out and, with and good you become, people and you become friends with people you didn't even know on no, a bus. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah, it's kind of funny that awkward minute when everybody's registering for the walk and nobody knows each other and there are all these wallflowers standing up against oh. the rope down the walls in the <laughs> in city the hall and and then on the way back the you're getting all these friend requests on Facebook and you're now friends with these people and seeing seeing them on a daily basis over social media and, and they're still reaching out so yeah I guess we'll throw a plug in for that right now this year it was canceled due to uh uh, COVID nineteen. But we went and walked it. But we we social distanced and took three vehicles and leapfrogged it just as our families. Just our families, yeah. just for some fun and, and a few. people. Uh, yeah. A little, so that's it was a little harder. <laughs> it was, <laughs> yeah. People. yeah. It is, but it was it still was fun and it was a good experience. But if if you live in the state of Utah or you live outside the state of Utah and you're interested in coming and doing that. Follow us on social media, Life's Worth Living Foundation. We're on every social media platform. Follow us. And Facebook actually has a Walk to Windover oh. page. And uh, we hopefully will be doing it. And the more it's looking like, it's probably just going to be April of next year. We but were hoping. My sweet little niece is still waiting. She I keeps know. saying, when are we doing this? And I get messages. Yeah every week of people yeah. asking when it's going to happen but i think it'll be next april and if you've already registered for this year and didn't get to walk you're still registered for next year so don't worry but leave us some some closing thoughts so if <clears throat> let me just ask you this if jed was here today what would you say to him i'll give you each a chance to answer that if he is here today, just like in the same spot, or here today, just here in this room with us today, what would you say with him? Uh, you know, first of all, I'll just tell him I love him, um, and he's and but uh, you know, and the things that happened have changed. Uh, you know, it was. I guess if he came back today, you know, after what has happened, is that what you mean? Yeah. You know that uh, that you know we love him, we miss him. Um, you know, the, but the things that have happened has changed our lives, and and uh, we're we're uh, wish he was here. But uh, if 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 he couldn't have changed, I still wonder where he is. You know, you know. So, but I guess I don't know. That's that's a hard question. I would squeeze him and hug him and kiss his little face off and tell him that I love him more than anything in the whole entire world. But I tell him that anyway. He knows that. He knows. He knows that. And I'm thankful that he's my son. And even if we had to do hard things together, it taught us and it helped us grow. 
And that's why we're here. We're here on earth for tests. If every day was perfect and roses, it wouldn't be a test, would it? No. And we need to see how we can handle it. And and I just want to do everything I can so I can be with you again someday. Yeah. So. He's a good kid. I never forget. He's got rosy cheeks and dimples, and oh, his and laugh! His laugh was uh, just crack you up, uh -huh. and he'd always do things to shock you. And, and he's still with us, and he's still watching over those kids, and he's still he is, he is. And I know that he's grateful for the work you guys have put in to make yeah, a difference. Yeah, he's very proud of you guys. Well, if I know if he was here, he would love to tell everyone to stay away from drugs and alcohol. At any cost, and to love life like he did, just keep loving life and enjoying the good things, and just stay away from the the crap. Yeah. So I agree. Well, I'm gonna end it with telling the listeners: if you are in a bad spot and you're in a spot where you're having thoughts that are scaring you. Don't go down that road. Reach out to somebody. If you've got a friend or somebody that you can trust, tell them where you're at. Nobody wants that for you. <clears throat> we need you to stay with us and stay here. And if you don't have that person that you feel like you can say that to, reach out and call the lifeline. Call 1-800. Now I'm, black, I'm blanking out. To call the hotline at 1-800-273-8255. There's somebody there to answer that call 24-7, 365 days a year, and you matter and you're enough. Um, we're grateful for you guys coming back week after week, listening to this podcast, hearing what we have to say. We're grateful for our sponsors, GTM Builders. Check them out online or visit one of their model homes. And uh, A. Warner Homes Real Estate uh, that brought us tonight's episode. Reach out to them at 801-867-5078. We appreciate all of you, and I uh, can't wait to talk to you again next week. Thanks so much, and thanks to the Hansons for being there tonight. Thank you. Guys, we love you. We love you, too.